All right, welcome to today's ALEC Policy Hour on the Taliban's takeover in Afghanistan. I'm Lee Schalk with the ALEC Policy Team. And before I hand it over to my colleague, Carla Jones, to introduce our panelists today and begin our discussion, I just wanted to go over a couple of ground rules for today's call. So viewers, please keep your lines muted. And if you have any questions, feel free to place them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen or in the Q&A box. Uh, both are available at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Now, if you're on your phone and you're unable to access this function, feel free to text your ALEC membership representative or you can email me at lshalk at alec.org. This policy hour will be recorded and shared in ALEC Connect, which is our private portal for ALEC members. Uh, so please check out ALEC Connect after this call concludes. Uh, if you'd like to rewatch it or share it with your colleagues. Uh, now I will turn it over to uh, Carla Jones, who is our senior director here at ALEC of our Federalism and International Relations Task Force. Carla. Thank you, Lee. Well, I'd like to begin by saying that our hearts go out to the families of those US military personnel as well as to the families of the Afghanis killed in yesterday's tragic bombing in Kabul. We are deeply saddened by these events, as well as by the disintegrating situation in Afghanistan over the past month. However, we are fortunate and frankly honored to have an outstanding group of experts to help give context to what's going on in Afghanistan and who can offer their thoughts on the ramifications of the withdrawal of US and NATO forces from Afghanistan. So now for our panel. Dr. Liam Fox, he's a member of the UK Parliament, former Shadow Defense Secretary, and former Defense Secretary, as well as the former Secretary for International Trade for the UK. He's also one of the most compelling speakers I've ever heard on national security issues. And he just let us know that he is the newest chairman of the Conservative Friends of America. Ilan Berman, he's senior vice president of the American Foreign Policy Council and a foremost expert on Islamic extremism. I've known Ilan for years and watched his work. He's excellent. Ambassador Kelly Curry, She's the adjunct senior fellow of the Center for New American Securities Indo-Pacific Security Program and the former US ambassador at large for global women's issues. She also served as a discussant at a Women's Caucus Policy Roundtable at Alex's recent conference in Salt Lake City, a link to a video recording um, that she and her colleagues did is in the chat box. Michael Hanlon. He's the Senior Fellow and Director of Research and Foreign Policy at Brookings Institution and a foreign policy expert I've been following for years. Thank you so much for joining us today. And finally, Representative Gene Ward. He's a Hawaii state lawmaker, aloha, with vast international relations experience, who has served on Alex Federalism and International Relations Task Force for more than a decade. I encourage you to take a look at their bios, which are in the chat box. Also in the chat box are articles and other materials that they've authored, as well as a link to Lutheran Social Services that is providing assistance to Afghani refugees coming to the US. So now let's get started. Michael. Can you tell us a little about the deal that then President Trump struck with the Taliban back in February 2020? What demands did we make with respect to restricting terrorist elements and possibly adhering to human rights norms in a Taliban-led Afghanistan? Greetings, uh, and thank you for having me. On the latter point, human rights norms, there wasn't much in the agreement about that at all except by implication, because the Taliban were obliged to try to negotiate a path forward for power sharing with the existing government. This was in, I believe, provision four of the agreement. 
and it was in one sense not considered to be the most immediate obligation. And of course, at some level, it was unenforceable because we were presuming that once there was this power sharing government, we would leave. And that was the logic behind the deal. So we wouldn't be there to enforce any commitments that had been made anyway. But we can say the Taliban never complied even with the spirit and the letter of that requirement because they never really sat down with the Ghani government and actually put forward any ideas for how to share power. They sat down for a couple of photo ops, uh, not part of the February 29th Accord, but after that. As you'll recall, the February 29th Accord is indeed between the United States of America and the group that refers to itself as the Taliban. We always had this cumbersome phrase. We didn't want to give them any more street cred than necessary. So if you read the document, you can Google it and find it. It's only a few pages long, but it, it basically says the, the group that calls itself the Islamic government of Afghanistan. But we don't really call them that. We didn't call them that at the time. And we still haven't decided whether to call them that now. Anyway, that's the human rights and power sharing side where the commitments were a little more ambiguous, but there was certainly no compliance. The more clear commitments were that the Taliban would not attack American or NATO troops in the time period that we remained in country, which was anticipated to be 15 months through May 2021, and also that, uh, that the Taliban would break ties with Al Qaeda. On the first point, the Taliban have apparently largely complied. Even yesterday, we are not alleging that they had a hand in. Uh, and prior to yesterday, there had been no Americans killed in Afghanistan since the February 29th accord had been signed. So the Taliban did comply with that part uh, at 99.9% you know, .9 at least. On the part about Al Qaeda, however, the UN itself documented that links remain between elements of Al Qaeda, most notably the Haqqani network based just over the border in Pakistan with the Taliban. And in fact, there are Haqqanis in the Taliban leadership who also pledge loyalty and membership to Al Qaeda. So on that point, there is non-compliance and the Taliban have never been consistent. Uh, I think at a practical level, we didn't think it likely they would you know, break off all ties. We would have been content to make sure that the Taliban not support Al Qaeda in any operational planning against our interests around the world. And that will still be, I'm sure, the kind of commitment we try to hold the Taliban to going forward if we offer any kind of limited access to their financial resources, any future humanitarian aid, any kind of diplomatic recognition. At a minimum, they're going to have to not help Al Qaeda come after us violently. Uh, but they have not complied with the true spirit or letter of that set of provisions either. So for the most part, I argue that the Taliban only really complied with the part about not shooting at us. And on the other provisions, they have not. Dr. Fox, what were your thoughts when the deal with the Taliban was first being negotiated? Um, we know that the then Afghan government wasn't involved in the negotiations. Um, did the president confer with our NATO allies during the talks? So I think we have to go back to why we went to Afghanistan in the first place. It wasn't because the Taliban themselves were an intrinsic threat to our security. It's because the Taliban gave space to the groups who were. They gave a permissive environment and we had to stop that. So why would you trust the same people uh, not to do the same thing all over again? That's, that's the security side. From the democratic um, front, uh, why would we sell out uh, a democracy that we'd sp spent so long trying to build up to uh, a, a group that had shown themselves, if not innately hostile, then certainly uh, willing to provide space to those who are. Why, why would we do that? Why would you sell out effectively the Afghan democracy we worked so hard to foster? Why would you do a deal with the enemies of the Afghan government without even consulting them? Uh, that, that I think is you know, the, the, the backdrop to it. I think it was uh, a, a dreadful act. You know, it's um, uh, those who say you, it, it simply switched forever war to uh, forever shame. Uh, there may be something in that. Uh, the idea that President Biden um, uh, so uh, despised President Trump's foreign policy that the first thing that he did was to implement it when he came to office is also very difficult, I think, for allies to understand. Uh, and the way in which it was done, even if it was going to be done, is unfathomable. Uh, any of us who worked uh, in the environment in Afghanistan and knew uh, 
uh, the way that the military operated, the one time you would not uh, uh, diminish your security presence is during the height of the fighting season. Uh, if you were going to do anything, you would do it at a different time. It seems to me that uh, uh, every box that could be ticked was ticked in the wrong place uh, for all of this. And then there is a, a wringing of hands at what was an inevitable consequence because the Taliban, as I say, may not be our enemies, but they have allowed 5,000 of our most uh, uh, venomous, committed and brutal enemies to walk out of Bagram prison. Did, did, did we think that that would be without consequence? Did we think that that would not provide a, a, an imminent threat to our people in Afghanistan, to those who were our allies in Afghanistan, and ultimately later on uh, an export of terror elsewhere? I, I, I find it almost impossible to just to understand the political thought processes that have taken us to this point. And, and you know, I'm, I'm particularly hate to be critical of, of the United States, particularly in foreign policy, but uh, this, this will go down as one of the great foreign policy uh, disasters uh, in recent times, I think, in American political history. And Dr. Fox, how do you think the events in Afghanistan will affect America's strategic alliances, especially our leadership in NATO? And will this be the tipping point, and I'm going to quote from your Conservative Home article, that drives Europe to build up as you called it, alternative capabilities, and um, as well as for Europe to assume a greater share of responsibility for international security. When I was Defense Secretary, Bob Gates and I um, kind of did a double act at the NATO summits. Uh, it was a sort of bad cop and worse cop act. Uh, he would give them both barrels and then so would I. Uh, about the fact that NATO countries simply would not spend. Uh, they, uh, on one hand, criticize uh, their own dependence on American foreign policy, and on the other, refuse to spend on the capability that would give them uh, any strategic freedom or even any greater influence in decision-making within NATO. So no, I do not think that this will be a spur for European countries. Many of them are already addicted to high spending big states uh, and are quite happy for American taxpayers to carry the burden of their security. They'll hypocritically uh, criticize decision-making and say that they've not been consulted, but not increase that capacity themselves. So I'm sorry, but uh, I don't think this will be the spur uh, to greater European uh, defense spending. Um, I think that uh, there is a, a, a problem for NATO uh, in how it makes decisions. I think there has been a problem for some time about understanding where threats come uh, in a globalized era, uh, including in areas like cyberspace, where it's the war of the invisible enemy that knows no geographical boundaries. I think there has been a misunderstanding of that. What worries me from a geopolitical point of view is that this will embolden not just America's enemies, but the enemies of the West and the enemies of our values. You can bet your bottom dollar that they're rubbing hands, uh, their hands in Beijing and in Moscow and in Tehran, and I, I was talking to one of the uh, Saudi ministers today, saying that all our enemies will be emboldened. Uh, we, are, we are all less safe than we were a couple of weeks ago because uh, the perception will be that we are not willing to defend even the gains that we have made at enormous cost. And um, it, it just amazes me that people can't seem yet to grasp that if you create a vacuum, it's likely to be filled with a lot of things that you don't like. And Ilan, um, you actually, Dr. Fox, you segued perfectly into the next question that I have for Ilan, which is another statement that struck me that the White House made was our only vital interest in Afghanistan remains today what it has always been, preventing a terrorist attack on the homeland. If that's the case, has our withdrawal from Afghanistan helped or hurt us in that regard? So I, I think really that's the $64,000 question. Um, I, I unequivocally come down on the hurt uh, side of the fence for a couple of primary reasons. First of all, uh, there's the nuts and bolts of our operational presence. Uh, in order to understand human terrain, you actually have to have humans. 
And so uh, there are no shortage of intelligence uh, professionals who have uh, made a point of saying publicly uh, because uh, there is uh, there are institutional equities that they're trying to protect that the way in which we've withdrawn has is going to make it much harder for us to monitor uh, the ebb and flow of Islamic extremists, uh, separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, uh, in terms of who is active, who is doing uh, what, where in Afghanistan. Um, I would only add to that that there is there's a second layer, I think, also. Uh, which is that uh, the optics on this are extremely important. Um, it's useful to remember that um, in the decade between uh, 1979 and 1989, uh, experts estimate that something like 40,000 uh, foreign fighters, foreign origin fighters uh, came to Afghanistan to join uh, the jihad against the Soviets. Uh, you saw a massive mobilization on that scale in just a couple of years not too long ago uh, in the context of Syria and Iraq, uh, joining forces with the Islamic State um, and joining uh, the Islamic State's uh, self-declared caliphate. So my big concern uh, in this context is the degree of inspiration that foreign radicals will draw from the appearance that the Taliban uh, have managed to play a weak hand comparatively, but play a weak hand very well and have more staying power, more resilience, and frankly, more fortitude than the United States. Um, it recalls the, the old uh, infamous quote by Osama bin Laden that you know, when there's a strong horse and a weak horse, uh, the public's very naturally uh, gravitate to the strong horse. Um, there's very, it's very difficult for me to, to imagine any way in which you know, PR uh, communications aside, any way the United States can spin our current pace of Afghan withdrawal as anything but a weak horse. And, and that's frankly liable to lend to uh, inspiration to not only to the Taliban's cause, but also to Islamic radicals globally who see this as a victory for their cause more broadly. And Michael, another troubling statement that the White House has made was that American troops should not be fighting in a war and dying in a war that Afghan forces are not willing to fight for themselves. Um, they put the number of Afghan troops at 300,000, a figure that has since been discredited. Would you mind filling in some of the details about what led to the Afghan army's rapid collapse and tell our listeners about the casualties that the Afghan army has suffered as well as the Afghan national police. Um, sometimes we forget that Afghanis have been fighting very hard for their country. Yes, Afghans certainly have. And I know Minister Fox and others who worked on this policy over the years tried to improve the training and the technical skills. But just a couple of statistics to answer your specific questions. About 5,000 to 10,000 Afghan soldiers and police were dying each year for the last decade. Sometimes that's because they were ambushed at checkpoints. So the bravery was simply being willing to go out to the checkpoint, but they were attacked before they even knew it. Sometimes, however, they also would go on uh, firefight, you know, uh, movements of one type or another, or engage in protracted uh, enemy gunfire, exchange of gunfire with the enemy and really fight hard. And uh, generally speaking, if they did that with our forces and with good commanders, two big ifs, they did pretty well. As the years went by, the Afghans developed a very good special forces sector, about 15,000 troops. They were being asked to do too much and they were often taking high casualties because they would go in and seize cities that the Taliban had temporarily taken part of or otherwise do the offensive fighting that produces you know, higher rates of injury and death. And they were tired as well, but they were very good. That is the group that I thought would fight hard until the end. And so I'll come back in a second to why I think they did not, but that group in particular. Then on top of that, we know that there, there were a number of, of Afghan police and army commanders who were corrupt, who were friends or cousins of the right person in the Afghan government who got their jobs for the wrong reasons. Uh, but there were also good commanders who planned operations and went out in the field with their troops. I, I remember in my visits to Afghanistan over the years between roughly 2008 and 2018, uh, there were certain 
units that were doing quite well. Uh, for example, the 201st and 203rd Corps in the eastern parts of the country during the mid 2010s had some very good commanders. They were doing a lot of offensive operations sweeps to drive Taliban out. And, and then once we got more serious about rebuilding capability in Helmand province, uh, that commander was pretty good for a while as well, but it was uneven. So if you had bad leadership, uncommitted leadership, non-professional leadership, the troops of course were not as inclined to fight hard themselves and they were often in it partly for a paycheck. They would fight, but if they had a chance to win more than just for the sake of honor to the or commitment to the nation in some abstract way. So now to conclude, I'll finally answer your question about why they collapsed or at least in my best assessment, it's always easy to predict the past. <laughs> I'm not sure I could have predicted this a month ago, uh, but I think Afghans also have a street smarts about them where they don't like to die for a losing cause. Most of them are not suicide bombers. Most of them are not people who just like to, you know, in some old fashioned medieval way, uh, you know, fight in hideously violent manner just because it's somehow in their blood. They're, 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 I give them credit for being a little smarter. And when the rug is pulled out from underneath them because the United States and NATO depart precipitously, with no real effort to build up a strategy that has a chance of holding. And then they are asked to fight in what's apparently going to be a losing effort, just a question of time. Even the CIA is saying, just a question of how many months. It turned out to be weeks and days, not months. But basically by the time we had made this decision, by the time President Biden made this decision, it was more or less being seen as a foregone conclusion. The Taliban would win, at least in most of the country. So to quote John Kerry, and I'll finish on this, but what you know, John Kerry said 50 years ago about Vietnam, how do you ask a man to be the last person to die for a mistake or for a losing cause? Afghans didn't want to fight if the outcome was already set in stone, already knowable, or at least if that was the perception. And while they weren't fighting on the battlefield, among the people fighting hardest, for a future Afghanistan were Afghanistan's women. Ambassador Curry, I found it fascinating that before the first Taliban takeover in 1996, something like 40% of doctors in Kabul, as well as around half of Afghanistan's civil servants were women. Describe what life was like for women under the Taliban the first time around. I think that there's pretty there's pretty widely understood um, knowledge that the Taliban in in the 1990s did not respect in any meaningful way the rights of women. They hold a very regressive view of Islam and Sharia law that um, requires women to always be covered when they they are not allowed to go out in public without a male guardian. Um, they are not, they were not allowed to go to school. They were not allowed to work outside the home. Um, they were basically allowed to, they, um, they were treated as property. Um, and girls as young as 12 were allowed to be married, um, and, and be the second, third wife of men. It, it, it was a very, um, very regressive view of, of women's rights and, and not, not, in, not even, um, even even by the standards of some of the more conservative societies in the Middle East, um, the Saudis and, and others, it was quite it was considered just quite um, breathtakingly backwards. Not even because of the the underlying um, normative aspects, but the way that it manifested in terms of denying women and girls opportunities for education and and that sort of and economic participation and how that negatively affected. The, um, the prosperity of the country stable place because of these restrictions. And you've recorded um, a, a Women's Caucus Roundtable at the ALA Conference in Salt Lake City with Michelle Beckering of USGLC and also outgoing ambassador to the US from Afghanistan, Roya Rahmani. And one of the most difficult parts of that recording to listen to is when Ambassador Rahmani 
thanked the United States for all we did to give women opportunity and freedom in her country. Could you describe really briefly what our troops were able to accomplish for women in Afghanistan? Well, actually, it was that the troops created space for the Afghan women to accomplish things. And the Afghan women who were given that opportunity, the women and girls who were given the opportunity to learn, to go to school, to, um, and to fully participate in public life, really made the most of all those opportunities. And they pushed and fought very hard because even outside of the Taliban, Pashtun society is very traditional and very conservative. The Taliban didn't, I, I always say this, you know, as medieval as they were, the Taliban didn't come from outer space. They, they were, in a sense, just a very extreme version of, of a very traditional Pashtun culture that, um, that had very, very traditional and, and um, very uh, regressive views. And so they still, even without the Taliban, women in Afghanistan still had to fight for everything that they, that they had. And so what has happened the last two weeks and what I, one of the reasons that I'm also not able to join you by video is that we were working with, um, I, I spent the last two weeks, two and a half weeks really now, because this effort started actually before the fall of Kabul, because women from the provincial areas of Afghanistan who were seeing that, who had, you know, where the Taliban was coming in and taking over, um, they were, were um, coming into, into Kabul, fleeing in advance of the Taliban. And they, um, and so you, you saw these educated women, these professional women, women who had served as judges, as police, um, as, as soldiers, as, um, as lawyers, as doctors, all of these um, women suddenly realizing that there was that, that space that they had fought so hard to take over was evaporating. And so we began, as soon as these provincial um, capitals started falling a couple, a few weeks ago, those of us that work with Afghan women and girls were seeing this exodus and, and seeing that this was a problem. And then even, you know, and then pretty early, even before the fall of Kabul, I was getting inundated with women saying, please help us get visas so we can leave and go um, we need to be out of here before the Taliban arrive. We need to go. And those pleas fell on completely deaf ears at the State Department. And we, it was stunning to watch the, not just the abandonment of, of the, the, the way that we abandoned the Afghan people as a whole, but the way an, a, an administration that claimed to care so much about women's rights just turn its back on Afghan women and girls in the most fundamental and, and horrifying way. And I literally just, right before I, the reason I was a little late getting on this phone call is because I've been having to call women since um, about, since about one o'clock, I've been having to call women that we were supposed to be evacuating today and tell them that the, the, the bus is not coming to pick you up. You need to go into hiding. You need to flee Kabul now. We cannot do anything more to help you now. We'll get back to you in a couple of days and see what, what's next. It is, it is so heartbreaking. And I'm oh, sorry. It is, it's to see the loss of what we built and just watch it collapse has just been just, I don't have words for it. And to see how incompetently and malevolently our government behaved towards these women and how little they did to help them. They didn't even make the minimal effort. In fact, I, times I, you know, we had these morbid jokes going on the past two weeks where there were times where I felt like the, the enemy was not the Taliban. It was the site, it was the state department. It was the processes that they had set up for us to try to evacuate these women were so ludicrous and Kafkaesque. I mean, it, it, it's just, there, there is going to need to be an accounting of what happened the past two weeks. It, I think that there need to be 9-11 style commission, a 9-11 style commission that really looks at what 
went wrong here the past two weeks. I literally just hung up at, at right again about an hour ago as we had a buzz of 53 women sitting outside the last gate that was open and we trying to get someone to go and convince the Taliban to let them come in to the compound. And we couldn't get the bureaucracy to move to do that. It is just something is wrong and broken in our foreign policy and national security infrastructure. And I just saw all of that brokenness in, in just high relief the past two weeks. I, I'm, I'm still a little bit in shock. I'm sorry, but it's just been horrific. Thank you very much for all that you're doing. And thank you very much for joining us today. Um, if you need to get off, I could ask the final question I was gonna ask you. If you want to stay on, um, you're welcome to Ambassador Curry. Which would you prefer? Thanks, Carla. I, I will answer your final question. And then I, I actually do need to get back to, to making calls and, and getting, you know, letting our partners know and deleting people's phone numbers off my phone. <laughs> Okay, the final question for you is, we understand the humanitarian impulse to protect women's rights. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why that's important economically? Um, as I was saying before, one of the main reasons that Afghanistan was pretty much a failed state in the 90s that allowed the um, allowed al-Qaeda, created that permissive environment that one of the previous speakers talked about, is because um, when you deny half the population the opportunity to participate in, in the public life of your country and the economic life of your country, you automatically just, you, you automatically put um, hand, huge handicaps on your country's prosperity and, and stability. And when the, when the way of, of the Taliban, the way of the gun, um, of, of banditry, and, and, and the kinds of, um, and, and, and basically an economy that ran on, on banditry and on, on other illicit activities rather than on normal economic activity is, is what you've decided to do with your economy instead of having productive investments in your, in your, pop, in your population then your country is going to be among the poorest on earth. And that is exactly what happened in Afghanistan. And you see this in other countries where women's rights are fundamentally denied, that they are unable to break out of cycles of poverty, deprivation, and conflict. And they become the kinds of places that, that from which terrorism and violence and extremism are, are able to flourish and then come and harm us in our homeland. And now we're going to see Afghanistan descend into a, a situation that will be very much like what we've seen in Iraq or in Syria, where you have violent extremist groups fighting against each other for power. You have, um, you may have some some groups, some violent groups that are not necessarily extremists, but they're not exactly, you know, avatars of human rights and good governance either, um, fighting against those groups. And it's just going to be. Um, you know, Afghanistan will again become a failed state. You're already seeing the bank, the banking system has collapsed. You can't get money. You know, there's money is not circulating. Um, the, the food supply is already in crisis. You're going to have massive refugee flows out of the country into countries that can very ill afford it. Um, Pakistan, Tajikistan. Um, and, and so you're creating a regional crisis, uh, similarly to what has been going on in Iraq and Syria for the past decade. And, and it's just now we're going to have another festering wound in the Middle East, a place where we were trying to, where Joe Biden was, and, and actually President Trump also wanted us to get out of, reallocate resources toward Asia. And now that, that is, you know, I, I don't see how that happens uh, in light of the current situation and, and, and the, the absolutely complete failed withdrawal and the, the ridiculous strategy that it was based on. Thank you so much, Ambassador Curry, for joining thank us. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, um, Carla. And thank you so for much. all the work that you're doing. 
Um, just to underscore what Ambassador Curry was saying, I believe the figure that Michelle Beckering gave us during the roundtable was 28 trillion would be added to the global economy if women were empowered. But if Michelle is out there, she should feel free to correct me in the chat. It's, yeah, we, we had done this analysis that you could add 28 trillion dollars to global GDP just by removing certain um, laws that were holding back women's economic participation in five areas. And, um, and, and so you see that allowing women to fully participate in a society, it's not just some feel good thing. It actually does promote peace. It promotes um, economic prosperity and it promotes American security. And so it's not just this, this isn't a niche or feel good issue. And we're going to see the consequences of failing to take it seriously and just having it as a slogan, which this administration has, has been more than willing to just slogan around women's rights in Afghanistan and talk about it, but has, has utterly failed to, to do anything meaningful to protect the rights of women and girls in Afghanistan. And in fact, just led them to the slaughter this, this past two weeks. And well, they never you. give I'm, up. I'm gonna go. Never give up, Thank Kelly. You, our prayers are with you. Thank you. I'm glad we got our East West Center kids out. All right. Were, that yeah. was one of our successes was getting those kids out for the East West Center. You're a fighter. One we got to continue ones. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And the next question is for Ambassador Jean. I mean, I'm sorry, Representative Jean Ward. You oh. should be Ambassador. <laughs> um. Another heartbreaking aspect of this entire situation are the people eligible for special immigrant visas, SIVs. And a lot of them were interpreters and others who assisted NATO and US forces in Afghanistan. Can you tell us a little about the model policy that you introduced and what led you to draft it and sponsor it in the first place? Uh Thank you, Carla, and thank you, distinguished members. It's it's a great. I do feel like an ambassador, uh, Carla, with such distinguished intellectual as well as action people who really want to make a difference in what's going on in this terrible point in American history. Uh, first of all, uh, I thought it was a no-brainer when we said, "Hey, let's get the guys out of Afghanistan." In the way that we are now with an open border in the south, we don't have any requirements. We can at least have our moral obligation fulfilled by giving those who are our counterparts or our workers, our allies, a passage into the United States. It's the moral thing to do. We did it in Vietnam. We had 110,000 people we evacuated. It's not rocket science, but you have to plan for it. And when you have a nation that takes its military out before it takes its civilians out, you wonder what kind of, as we call in Hawaii, kapakahi, upside down, ass backwards, kind of logic. And I think we're in the process of having a huge tube of lipstick coming out of Washington, trying to make out of the pig something that it is, it's otherwise not going to be, no matter how much lipstick that they run out of. So in a way, kind of our, our, our discussion today is kind of like unraveling some of the stuff that's reality on the ground versus what is, quote, the narrative. And I cannot believe, regardless if you're a Democrat or Republican or American or a Brit or whoever, that you would sacrifice the truth for the sake of keeping a narrative true, just so we can pull out and say, you know, we pulled out in 9-11, we symbolically made sure that 20 years was symbolic on the day that we had the 9-11 beginning. I think that's such wholeheartedness. So confidence under leadership, confidence in the team that, that Biden has put together, I think we have to have a total accountability. And by the way, people of America are not stupid. Can't say for so long so many things that are true is the case when you hear the Kelly Currys and all the people that we're hearing on the news that are really directly in contact with these people that the White House is lying. Let's not uh, mince words about that. When they are not giving the truth, the moral authority of a government falls. I know our good MP, Mr. Fox, will agree to that. Once his moral authority is gone, the credibility of that government is going on. Right now, the credibility of this government is very, very, very lacking. And unless we get some answers, and then let me put last, look, I'm an old Peace Corps volunteer. 
I'm a UN guy. I'm a Vietnam veteran, by the way, translator, interpreter. So I know I've been there, done that kind of thing. But let me say this, there's a chance that there could be political will regained by the White House to say, hey guys, nobody's going to be left behind. And in fact, they've promised that there's no uh, Vietnam, uh, sorry, there's no Afghan uh, ally going to be left behind, as well as no American. That's yet to be seen, given what uh, Ambassador Curry has just said. But there's hope that we could gain political will. We could gain the sense of who we are as Americans. We're behaving like we are just a nobody who's got a power, power to a power who, in effect, in a, in, in a way, is making us do the things that we never wanted to do, but now we're doing it because we said we were going to do it. We have the power, and I'm not talking about uh, Ali North. And there's a, I guess, up in the north where there's resistance of a few thousand worker, a uh, few thousand fighters. But when the fact, not only do you not get your civilians out, you literally abandon billions of dollars of technology and weaponry, which can be retrofit by our enemies or by used by the immediate enemies. Those are totally inexcusable, inexcusable kinds of things. How we deal with those things again, I think we just got to look at is they're putting lipstick on a pig and we've got to look at it as it is. And that's realistically. So Carla, thank you for the timeliness. I've never seen Alec do anything so timely. So pertinent, lives are in the process as we speak, being saved or lost, depending on what happens. And hopefully anybody who's listening to this, other than those Alec freaks who are trying to make uh, mad about any, anything that Alec, we can save one life by the seminar, by one thing that anyone has said, it'll be worthwhile. So thank you for having me as part of this uh, panel. Thank you, Representative Ward. and. Michael, would you like to briefly describe some of the other people that are at risk um, from a Taliban-ruled Afghanistan, from religious minorities, academia, and what are the hurdles in their path to escape, especially given our August 31st deadline? I would identify, of course, the Hazara. And this is a partly distinct ethnic group that has roots in Mongolia and China. And when you see them, uh, it's fascinating. They have features that are sort of a blend of Asian and Afghan features, and they tend to be Shia, and they tend to live in the central part of the country, uh, in the mountains where those statues uh, of Buddha were destroyed by the Taliban 25 years ago. So that's one group. That's about 15, 10 to 15 percent of the population, as I recall. Um, then, as you say, certainly, you know, Westerners or Western educated uh, or pro-Western Afghans who are either, uh, I don't wanna say secular because many of them are quite religious and I would argue more religious than the Taliban uh, because they have a truer sense of what Islam is about in terms of preaching love for other people and desire to support and be fair to other people. But, uh, but certainly pro-Western Afghans, well-educated Afghans, uh, people at the American University in Afghanistan, for example, where I've visited a number of times, did an event with a number of their younger professors this past winter before we pulled the plug on the mission. And I know that there are some Americans affiliated with the American University in Afghanistan who are still working hard to try to get people out uh, in, that, in that group. And so that would certainly be you know, a third category, the, the, the educated, uh, in addition to sort of the reformist pro-Western groups and women and Hazar. So I guess that's now at least four groups. We could go on and identify others, but uh, you know, certainly people, there aren't too many Christians among the Afghan population, but certainly that's not a group that the Taliban would look favorably upon. Certainly anybody who's uh, you know, not compliant with their own interpretation of Sharia law, even if they profess to be Sunni Muslim, would be on the outs with the Taliban, at least historically. So I think that in addition to trying to stay beyond August 31st and get out people who feel acutely and personally threatened, we also need to develop a longer term strategy to try to incentivize the Taliban to actually govern in a more moderate way than before without exaggerating our leverage, without exaggerating uh, our re realistic expectations. But we still need to insist on rights of women's education, uh, legal protections for women, rights for women to work, and all these same 
rights also for the Hazara, any other non-Sunni, uh, any so-called apostates or people not seen to be in compliance with the Taliban's own very twisted, peculiar view of what a good uh, Sunni Muslim should be. And, um, and so I think we still have a lot of leverage in the form of diplomatic recognition, access to bank accounts and humanitarian assistance, where we need to try to steer the Taliban in the direction they claim that they intend to go. But obviously we're gonna need to verify that. Uh, by the way, a UN observation force might be a nice, made up of, of uh, individuals from Muslim countries, might be a nice way to have eyes and ears on this, not to enforce a certain expectation of you know, human rights or anything else, but to observe and confirm and incentivize compliance with that sort of minimalist uh, you know, set of standards of what a more moderate Taliban has to do by way of the law and by way of its own actions. Um, Ilan, can you tell us about the Islamic extremist groups that are proliferating throughout Afghanistan um, from known entities like Al Qaeda to groups that many of us had never heard of until yesterday, like ISIS-K? Who are they and what is their relationship to the Taliban? Are they rivals? Are they friends? Um, just give us a, a view of the landscape. Sure. Well, I mean, there, there's a lot here. So let me just content, uh, content myself with, with pointing out a few things. Um, the terrorist attacks, uh, terrible terrorist attacks that happened yesterday were carried, about, uh, carried out by uh, ISK, right? The Islamic State in Khorasan, in the Khorasan province. Um, so in order to understand that, uh, you have to understand that the Islamic State, uh, even though they had uh, for a duration of time a core caliphate, what they called a core caliphate, in Iraq and Syria has built franchises very much like its progenitor, Al Qaeda. And the Islamic State's Khorasan province is the uh, Southwest Asian province, uh, which is in direct competition with the Taliban. Uh, and there is actually you know, what political wags would call a running gun battle for political influence uh, between the Taliban and Al Qaeda uh, which, despite what the president has said, you know, it, it's very evident from uh, open source intelligence that Al Qaeda remains in the country and remains a relevant player, but not a decisive one. Uh, and here, the big fault line is between the Taliban and the, ta the radical uh, exclusionary strain of Sunni Islam that it wants to impose and the equally violent exclusionary brand of Sunni Islam that the Taliban is trying to impose. Um, for the outside observer, this doesn't, uh, the nuances tend to get lost here. But what we're actually talking about is two different conceptions of pretty much the same thing. Uh, but, you know, the Fortune 500 is the Fortune 500 for a reason. Only one company can be number one. And for the very same uh, reason, the Islamic State's competition with the Taliban is one for supremacy in terms of religious interpretation in Afghanistan. And in the background, what you have is, is something that, that uh, frankly, far fewer people are talking about, is the fact that um, uh, across the border, um, you have uh, Shiite Iran, which has a very different conception of the world, which has had a troublesome relationship with Afghanistan uh, when it was under the Taliban between 1996 and 2001, uh, but at the same time, tends to see itself as being able to create strategic depth in Afghanistan. And so... Uh, the, for the Iranians, there is some tactical cooperation that has existed in the past and is likely to continue in the future uh, with the Taliban. Uh, but at the same time, the Iranians are trying to expand their regional sphere of influence. And so uh, the border regions of Afghanistan that abut the Islamic Republic are likely to become areas of competition between the Taliban and uh, in, in parts between the Islamic State and the Iranian uh, state promoted uh, Shiite version of political Islam. How has China benefited from the withdrawal of U.S. troops, and are there implications for Taiwan? Well, there there certainly are. Um, and and what I would point out here, um, and uh, Stephen was kind enough to share the article that I wrote uh, earlier this week on uh, sort of long term strategic implications. But I really think that there's three of them. One of them is the one we discussed earlier. The the inspirational nature of what the Taliban has managed to do for Islamic radicals and the likelihood that this is likely to spark a new wave of foreign fighters that uh, the international community is going to have to deal with. The second is the question of alliance solidarity. Um, and the, 
not the withdrawal itself, but the way we have carried out the withdrawal, it has uh, sparked very good, very appropriate questions from our allies, including from uh, countries like Taiwan, including from countries like Israel and South Korea, about not only the durability of the American commitment to their security, but frankly, you know, for countries that are more sort of in flux or more in play, um, the advisability of it, the advisability of hitching their wagon to the American strategic concept. And that gets us to the third big takeaway, which is all about China. We are now in the context of uh, very much uh, great power competition with China across multiple domains. Um, and so Afghanistan has the potential to become this really interesting litmus test uh, for that competition, because the Biden administration has already said that they're gonna stop short of recognizing the Taliban. And in fact, they're gonna make the Taliban into a rogue state, into a pariah state, if they don't conform with international norms about human rights. But other countries are saying very different things. And China in particular has spent a lot of time and a lot of money over the last several months building a parallel relationship with the Taliban under the assumption the Taliban is going to come to power. And as a result, what you have is a paradigm in which the Taliban, unlike the way they were 20 years ago, is not really a pariah state. It's in fact uh, on track to be recognized by the Chinese, but also by the Russians and the Iranians. And if that actually happens, the Biden administration will not be able to isolate uh, the Taliban in Kabul. And in fact, uh, the Chinese version of how the world should treat uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan is gonna become the dominant one. It's gonna be a major blow to American strategic influence. And Dr. Fox? Just to, I was very struck by the comment of the president that the aim of policy in Afghanistan is to prevent another attack on the homeland. Roll that back 20 years. We went to Afghanistan as a NATO alliance because there had been an attack on one of our members. This was not just about America. This was about our solidarity. Article 5 was invoked because one of our members had been attacked. The view was in together, out together. We went in together, we fought and we died together. The question is now, why is America wanting to come out on its own uh, rather than waiting for a, a, a properly coordinated NATO withdrawal? It is that change and sh that shift in emphasis over that time, which I think uh, will be raising the biggest number of queries in the minds of Western allies of the United States, uh, because it wasn't just about America. It wasn't just because 2,605 Americans died at 9-11. It's because other people died and it was an attack on our collective way of life and our values. That is why we went to Afghanistan. It was about our collective security. And we can't surely have gone from a belief in that collective security to, to America only. Um, uh, e even worse than America first, America only is an unsustainable policy. Uh, and, and as Elan and others have, have very correctly alluded to, it's not just America's Western political and military allies that are getting this message. Um, in geopolitics, you are only as strong as your last action, not your last speech. Um, and uh, how America has carried out this policy, as well as the policy itself, will be under intense scrutiny, because the question will be, were it to happen again, would other allies be as willing to follow the United States again? Uh, for someone who believes that America is a force for good in the world, and that our relationship with the United States is one of the most important relationships in the world, to have to listen to the very valid criticisms that were being made, I think, in the House of Commons this week was a very, very sad event for, for many of us. Uh, and I hope that um, uh, following this, that the United States will understand that it, it, it is the world's biggest economy, it's the world's biggest military. The idea that you can retreat in a world of greater interconnectivity, including of risk, is not a valid policy to have in the 21st century. Uh, some serious rethinking needs to be done. Uh, and America's allies would absolutely welcome uh, a change away from this uh, policy that seems to have been designed to suit a soundbite rather than global reality. And before we go to questions that I'm going to pose to all of the discussants, Representative Ward, one of the most common questions I get from people who aren't familiar with state legislators is what 
why are state legislators interested in international issues? And some in the media have even specifically criticized our task force saying, well, they have no business discussing these issues. They don't understand them. How would you answer those people? Uh, the myopic people have existed from the very beginning. The isolationists, the Americans who look at only America from World War I to two, to even now where I would say in this, this is an example of where Hawaii stands out. There were no travel bans in existence. And this is where the, the, the states are the workshops of the nation, basically. We, because of our Hawaii economy is based upon tourism, we knew we had to limit tourists, even from the mainland. We got through the White House, the Department of Transportation and the federal uh, FDA permission to do this. And Alaska did it. And we protected our economies. If we were not in international affairs about, oh, yes, so COVID is an international thing. You've got to limit people on the national level. Well, if that myopic view was to be taken, I think we'd be so much of a lesser nation because we are alert on the front. We have more ethnicities in Hawaii than probably most states on the mainland. We are unplugged. We are in charge in, otherwise in, in communication with the rest of the world. To say that that's not important is I think part of the belittling of Alec when they don't see what a model legislation is like we did now where people can say, President Biden, Congress, expedite these people. We can, as legislators, push those in the congressional level to make a huge difference. Right now, we haven't done that. And just yesterday, my office, through our colleagues, wrote a letter to President Biden. Have as many sign on as possible saying, President Biden, keep your promise. You're going to bring no, uh, you're going to leave no Americans left behind, nor any of those Afghan allies. We have all the power in the states, except we generally sell out because of the giving, because they give us money and we kind of shut our mouth. Otherwise, we have unrealized potential as state legislators. And thank you, uh, Alec, for bringing us together and having an international task. In fact, I, don't, I think if there was not an international task force, I probably wouldn't be a member of Alec because we can always get information about other issues. But internationally, as you put together just this issue right here and this panel, uh, is very, very important. And, and I'll tell you, on a personal level, having met a former ambassador to the United States, uh, Rahmani, uh, it really brings all this stuff home personally, of which we can bring home to our own states and communicate to our own people. And I want to say to the, the good uh, MP uh, Fox, keep speaking out. Don't let America tell you that, hey, America's back and we are going to be as loved as well as anything because we are not Trump. We need to stand up and be a little bit <clears throat> less than uh, Biden-centric the way that this definition of uh, America is de developing right now. So again, Carla, we, we've got the opportunity through Alec and to say that the international task force is a waste of time is really a misguided opinion of who we are as Americans and who we in the world that we are. I'm an old Peace Corps volunteer. The reason why Kennedy sent us there is not because it was the right thing to do, it, because it, or because the Russians were there, because it was the right thing to do. Those kinds of things are more international minded than people are able to tolerate. And as soon as we kind of shut ourselves to the rest of the world, that's when I think the, as the good uh, MP said, that's when the good of America ceases to exist. We just exist for ourselves and not for the good of the rest of the world. And I don't say this in a, in a uh, virtual signaling way, but that is one of the major purposes that we've got to keep in mind of who we are as Americans and what we've committed to do. And particularly right now, our reputation is on the line with the Afghan people and the American people, what promises we've made. And moral responsibility is there and it's ours to fulfill. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative Ward. And the final question to Michael, Ilan, and Dr. Fox, what is the legacy of this withdrawal going to be? Are we going to look for, back on it as unfortunate but inevitable, or are we going to wish we had ma maintained a security presence in Afghanistan? Michael, you first, then Ilan, then Dr. Fox. Thanks. Uh, well, first, I agree with Ilan's earlier analysis and with uh, Minister Fox's and with the words of Representative Ward that 
uh, that there are going to be consequences and people are going to take a reading on us and on this president who may be an experienced Washington insider and a relatively uh, older gentleman, but he's a new president. And we shouldn't stay in a mission that we've decided is unsuccessful just to prove our credibility. As I put in the chat, that was the mistake of Vietnam. But I don't think this mission was inevitably headed for defeat. It was certainly frustrating. It was not living up to its highest standards and it had no end in sight. But we also only had three to 4,000 American troops on the ground at the end, another 8,000 or so uh, NATO and other foreign troops, which meant this was a mission where our allies were doing more than half of the work for the first time. And we should have been grateful for that and coordinated even more closely with NATO allies as a result of that burden sharing. But in any event, the point is it was a sustainable level of presence and we should have given time for something to maybe evolve in a more favorable direction for the Pakistanis to decide that they wanted to put more pressure on the Taliban, for some of the Taliban leadership to die and be replaced by new leaders who might have a different perspective. We didn't need to be in a hurry and the peace process was never given a fair chance. So I would have been willing to stay for many more additional years and I hope that the verdict of history will be that that's what we should have done, even though it won't be able to undo the damage. Just as we still debate the lessons of Vietnam, however, I suspect that we'll debate the lessons of Afghanistan for a long time, and I don't expect a consensus anytime soon. So in that sense, I don't really know how to answer your question, but I do know that it's important right now for the Biden administration to telegraph to the world that it is aware of the hits that its credibility has taken, and aware of the need to show American and allied resoluteness around the world so that we don't create a false impression that we're somehow pulling back in the Western Pacific or in the Middle East or in some other key theater. Thank you. Ilan? Sure. Uh, no, I, I, I agree with Michael. Uh, my sense is, is this. Uh, look, I think the uh, in the context of American politics, the writing has been on the wall for some time, uh, up until we saw the actual results of the Afghan withdrawal and sort of the horrific scenes of mayhem that have ensued. Uh, there were pretty healthy majorities, uh, both on the left and the right, uh, in support of uh, ending our mission in Afghanistan, which has come to be seen, uh, I think incorrectly, but it's come to be seen as a forever war. So what we're actually talking about here is continuity, but the, in terms of the sort of the desire to disengage, but the way we've been disengaging uh, is, is the real question. And I found the, the president's uh, speech uh, in which he talked about uh, the first part, but not the second part, a little bit disingenuous because the question that we're really debating here and, and what we're agonizing over is not the question of whether we should stay or go. Uh, in American, I mean, we can have that conversation, but in American political parlance, the numbers really I think, speak volumes. But the way we've set about disengaging, the way we've set about not winding down the mission, not empowering allies to step up as we step down, uh, not creating a security condominium uh, with the countries of Central Asia or, or a multitude of other things that we could have done as we scale back our presence has created the political situation, the frankly, the debacle that we're seeing currently. And I, I think the president does himself no favors by pretending that everything is going swimmingly. It's not going swimmingly. The goal here is to admit, and the goal here is to pivot, because the long-term game, strategic game, is all about American credibility globally. And it's been dented. And the mission, the number one mission right now, I think, is uh, us reassuring our allies who are looking at us askance after what's happened in Afghanistan, that we're, we're steady, uh, we're reliable, we're dependable, we have their backs. Uh, I, frankly, I, I think that's gonna be a harder sell now moving forward. And Dr. Fox. Well, I, I very much agree with um, uh, what, what Mike and Alana have been saying. Um, I think, how, how do we come out of this? Well, I think a lot will depend on, on the, uh, how um, honest the analysis is about where the policy originated and how it was carried out. The I mean, I'm a politician. The temptation is always to say, well, I was right all along, uh, but this is too big a call. Uh, it, it is about the credibility uh, of the United States. It's about the willingness of allies to go along with the United States should we face another common security crisis. And I think it's also about understanding that you cannot disengage in an era of globalization where our interconnectivity and our interdependence is greater 
than ever before. The concept of over there has limited value um, economically and in security than, than it had before. But I think even more important than any of those things is to see the bigger picture. We live in an era where we are geopolitically being challenged by countries like China in particular, but also by Russia, by Iran. They want to see a world that is more permissive for totalitarianism. We need to create a world that is more permissive for democracy and rule of law and liberty. Our values are being challenged globally in a way that they have not been uh, in, in living memory. Uh, and we need to understand that we are in intellectually, politically, the, the battle of our lives. Well, I apologize for running over, but I want to thank our panelists. They were absolutely terrific. If there were questions in the chat box that we weren't able to get to, feel free to email them to me at kjones at alec.org. Stephen, you're welcome to put the email address in the chat box and I'll get the questions to the speakers. Um, I also want to thank all of you who attended the ALEC Policy Hour, as well as Stephen Rupp on our public affairs team, who makes it all look easy and seamless. Um, I also want to remind you that in the chat box, there is a link to Lutheran Social Services for Afghani refugees coming to the U.S., and I want to wish everyone a safe and happy weekend. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Carla. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Carla. you Dr. Thank you, Fox. Gentlemen. It's been an honor to have you. Thank you, Representative Ward. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alan. And it My was pleasure. Thanks.